<laughs> it's my pleasure to welcome Aaron Silverstein of Harvard University, who will speak to us today about plane curve singularities in the absolute Galois group of, of Q. Okay. Hi. Um, so what I want to talk about uh, today is uh, we'll see the plane curve singularities um, and Galois cube bar of Q sort of come in at the end when I, I put things together. But what I, I want to talk about uh, are a few names, uh, namely Torelli, Schottky, and Grothendieck. Um, and I want to take things that maybe uh, have been traditionally thought of as being in Grothendieck territory and sort of move them over to maybe classical Torelli and Schottky territory. Um, so let, let me say what I mean. Uh, so since the beginning of algebraic uh, geometry, uh, people have realized that somehow there are two main types of invariants for an algebraic variety. Um, there are discrete invariants, and then there are continuous invariants. Uh, so a discrete invariant, perhaps the archetype of a discrete invariant in, algebra in algebraic geometry, is the genus of a curve. This is, uh, and what we mean by that is that any two curves, if you can deform them, uh, they, uh, if you can deform them one into another uh, without becoming singular, uh, then they'll have the same genus. Um, and what we know is, in fact, that's the only invariant that you need uh, in order to determine uh, when two curves can be uh, deformed uh, without going through um, a singular thing. Uh, because of this, okay, and then the continuous invariant is going to be the position in the moduli space. So moduli space of curves looks like a bunch of, uh, it looks like a bunch of varieties, each of which, uh, each of the components are uh, numbered by genus. Um, and the continuous invariant is somehow the, the place in that, in that, in that, in that, um, in that variety. Uh, so the second theme, and now, and I guess this is something that maybe goes, uh, well, one might ask, what makes an invariant discrete and what makes it continuous? And sort of the non-trivial thing that one can say is that discrete invariants are usually topological in nature, and continuous invariants are somehow geometric in nature. Um, and so when we want to describe uh, an algebraic variety of some sort, usually the first thing that, that we do if we want to classify it is we ask, okay, what is its topological type? Maybe there are other topological invariants associated to geometric structures. Uh, and then from there we want to figure out what the continuous, uh, sort of what the space of all, um, what the space of all varieties which have those discrete or topological uh, structures is. Um, so coming from that, we can look at uh, the Torelli, the classical Torelli theorem uh, can somehow be thought of as, uh, and in fact these Torelli problems which have been generalized, for instance, um, uh, Clements and Griffith's uh, Torelli problem for the cubic three, uh, their Torelli theorem for the cubic threefold, things like this, and then there are plenty of other uh, theorems of this sort. The idea is that I give you, so a pro what I'm going to call a Torelli problem, and this is this is not to attribute this problem necessarily to Torelli, but this is something which sort of is born out of out of the Torelli th theorem. I, I feel. Um, is if I give you a discrete or a topological invariant of an algebraic variety, How much continuous structure uh, do I need to put 
on this uh, discrete structure. Uh, to determine it. Yuck. Um, so the classical Torelli theorem uh, the classical Torelli theorem says that, so as I said, for curves, um, the classification of curves by their genus classifies them according to their fundamental group. And the genus is the rank of the first homology, which is just the abelianization of this group. Um, and I, I hope if any of you are not familiar with this, please tell me and I'll explain a little bit. OK. Uh, and the way that you can think of the sort of algebraic structure on a curve is that it gives a Hodge structure on the two-step nilpotent quotient, on the maximal two-step nilpotent quotient of the fundamental group of the curve. So, this is the same as saying, normally the way that this is phrased. I have no idea what you said. Okay, so I'm I'm about to explain. All right. So normally the way that uh, the Torelli theorem. So let's let's go from the classical Torelli theorem to that. Uh, so there is. So the classical Torelli theorem says that if I give you h1 of a curve x. Uh, If I give you h1 of x, z, excuse me, um, inside of h1 of uh, x r, uh, where x is a curve. So I give you this information. Uh, and now there's a complex structure induced on this uh, by there's, there's now a complex structure and a, yeah, there's an I acting on this vector space, but not necessarily respecting the lattice. And I is an operator whose square is negative one. Every I looks like that. Is that okay? So what's the theorem? <laughs> the theorem is that if I know this, this is not enough to determine the curve. So this is given by Hodge theory. But if I know the um, cup product pairing also, and the way that it's compatible with these structures, then that determines the curve. Vivek, you look incredulous. Is that not the Torelli theorem you're used to? Well, if you write the whole theorem on the board. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um. So this data determines x. Jacob, are, are we OK with this? Yeah. Vivek? All right. P please just tell me if you have problems. <laughs> OK. Uh, so now the neat thing about this is that this actually specializes uh, so one looks at this and one sees uh, sort of a lot of information, but really what this can be, uh, this and this actually come from the fundamental group of the curve. Um, namely, the, uh, if I give you the two-step nilpotent quotient, the maximal two-step nilpotent quotient of the fundamental group of the curve, uh, and I'm, whenever I write down fundamental groups, I'm going to lie a little bit because I'm going to omit a base point. So no statement is ever quite true without including a base point. But in everything that I am going to do, uh, you can always stick a base point in there to make the theorem something which makes sense and is true. <laughs> so pi 1, 2 of x, it maps onto h1 of x. Uh, so reformulation. So the maximal two-step nilpotent of x maps onto the first homology of x. Uh, Can you just say what is a two-step nilpotent quotient? Yes. 
uh, it is the maximal, it satisfies the universal property that any time the group maps to a two-step nilpotent group, it factors through this group, what, which what is, is itself two-step nilpotent. What is a two-step nilpotent? Two nilpotent group? Uh, I apologize. <laughs> a two-step nilpotent group is, is that what was confusing you at the beginning? Uh, it's a central extension. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a group which has a decomposition like this, uh, where this is central. This is abelian, this is abelian, and the action of conjugation is trivial. Okay? That's what it means to be two-step nilpotent. Um, sorry for not, I didn't understand that was your problem. Mea culpa. Um, <laughs> at any rate, uh, the theory of nilpotent groups is very interesting because it's very close to being linear. Um, so even though these are non-abelian objects, there's a way in which they ha behave like abelian objects because there, in fact, uh, exist Lie algebras uh, which uh, somehow embody their properties. Um, so there exist lineariz linearizations of this. Uh, I don't really need to get into that very much right now except to say that uh, because you can sort of turn this uh, short exact sequence into something from linear algebra, uh, you are able to formulate Hodge theory on it. Um, and this Hodge theory reflects uh, this Hodge structure with the cup product. And by the way, the way that the cup product comes in is if you remember the fundamental group of a curve, uh, at least over a characteristic zero field, um, is almost free. It has just one relation. And that relation is given by the intersection form. Uh, and so actually what you get here is uh, something which is common to two-step nilpotent uh, groups is that there is a map from H1 of X wedge, so the exterior, the exterior square of H1 of X maps onto the center of the group just by the commutator mapping. Um, and in fact, the kernel of this is exactly the intersection pairing. It's the line generated by the dual to the intersection pairing when properly interpreted. Um, so really, the, the one relation in the fundamental group uh, interprets this cup product which shows up in the Torelli theorem. And that's really the, the first point that I want to make, is the things that the kernel is a z, but which z? And that, that's the point, is that that z picks out if I have, um, it's entirely possible to have different z's showing up here in the way that that interacts with the uh, Hodge structure. Um, that gives you, I mean, that, that determines the curve. So the Torelli theorem should somehow be thought of, uh, in this context, as uh, I take a single uh, discrete structure, which is, the fundamental group, and I put some structure on it, and I don't need to put a structure on the entire fundamental group. I'm actually lopping off most of it. <laughs> at the, I'm lopping off the second commutator group, which is a huge group. Um, but then that, with this extra algebraic structure, that allows me to recover the curve. So, so you said this complex structure I, right, on H1X, mm -hmm. on that real vector space of dimension 2G, yes. determines a Hodge structure on pi 1 on the second hypothetical quotient. What is exactly? So it doesn't determine a Hodge structure on that. It determines a Hodge structure on the Lie algebra. Uh, I did not write that down. Um, and I don't really want to. Because this is the point of, of this theorem. But I'm, setting, I'm using this to set up. Uh, I can recommend for you references to this if you're, if you're interested in it. Uh, it's, um, but I don't actually want to dwell on this too much at the moment. I, uh, apologize. Um, so, Hain, can you give a reference? Hain, for example? Does, does Hain actually do this? I was actually going to say that you can find it in Deline's paper on pi 1 minus 3 point, uh, pi 1 of p 1 minus 3 points. At least it should be implicit in there. Um, I, I don't really, I, I'll dig. At any rate, uh, so the, the problem, this, ter this generalized Torelli problem is if I give you a discrete invariant like the fundamental group, uh, what sort of uh, analytic or geometric stuff do I have to put on it in order to determine, to actually determine the algebraic uh, variety from which it came from? Um, and the Schottky problem on the other hand, which I'm not going to talk about uh, in, uh, I'm not going to talk about too much, but I want to mention it. Um, 
you could call it a generalized Trotsky problem. If I give you some structure, some abstract structure which could come from a which could come from a variety on top of some discrete structure, which could come from a variety, how do I know when that uh, when that extra structure actually does come from a variety? Um, that's a very interesting problem, and one of the interesting problems about it, one of the very interesting things about it is the fact that it's difficult to formulate. Um, there are many answers uh, to this problem, and I have a feeling we'll, discuss, we'll probably even to the classical Schottky problem um, for curves. We'll probably discover more answers uh, in the future. Um, okay. So growth and Deke, inspired by inspired by Faltings as proof of the Mordell conjecture. Um, Grothendieck uh, wrote uh, what I believe was a grant application to a French uh, science funding agency. Maybe it was the what the CNRS or something. Um, and uh, he also wrote a letter to Faltings in which he uh, laid out um, a program uh, which we now call the Annabelian program, um, a bunch of conjectures which essentially had the following form. Grothendieck's idea was that one, among other things, because there are many, many ideas in this paper, is that one could unify these continuous and discrete invariants by the generalization of the fundamental group that uh, he had discovered in the 1960s, uh, maybe even late 1950s. Professor Kleiman, do you know <laughs> the Atal fundamental group? When was it exactly? Worked out uh, well. It was in SGA yeah. one, I think, 60, 61, but Yeah, but that means it was probably bouncing around. Okay. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, late 50s, early 60s, uh, he had come up with this notion of an etal fundamental group. Um, and it has the fun property uh, that if. So. Put a header here. Uh, idea Now, his Torelli theorem, the idea that you could have this Torelli theorem, it goes much, much further than normal Torelli theorems, where the idea was just to try and synthesize uh, or to try and identify um, a variety from its fundamental group. What Grothendieck uh, said that you could do is that, in fact, you could just reconstruct categories, or uh, you could reconstruct the, categories of the category of varieties, if you were clever enough, purely in terms of group theory. That you don't even need to you know, deal with all of, all of this continuous stuff. You have to, that this fundamental group is in fact such a complicated and intricate object that it'll encode um, everything as long as you're asking the right questions about the right varieties. Um, so why, why did he believe this? Well, the invariants that we understand, these sort of continuous invariants that I've been talking about and not describing very well, um, are usually come from Hodge theory. And Hodge theory can be mimicked somehow by Galois actions. Uh, are, you, are you okay with this? Is this? Well, I'm just trying to remember the history. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so the idea is that if I have his, uh, the Seytal fundamental group uh, had the absolutely wonderful property that if I have so here's a theorem, which is that if I have a uh, variety x over k, uh, 
uh, where actually k is any field, then um, there exists a short exact sequence. Let's actually say k is perfect. So I don't write down a technically false thing. Perfect field. Um, pi 1 etal of x over k bar, which is going to be the separable closure of k. So this is going to be the base change of this variety to k bar. And once again, I'm omitting, uh, I'm omitting base points in a rather cavalier fashion. Excuse me. And this here is the absolute Galois group of k. Um, now, anytime I have a short exact sequence of groups, I get an outer action of the quotient on the kernel. And so this gives me an outer action of this Galois group on this etal fundamental group. Now, this etal fundamental group, uh, in the cases that uh, we're interested, um, is actually computable from geometry. It's just the profinite completion. So one of the comparison theorems is let, um, let k be let k be a subfield of the complex numbers, then uh, x then this pi 1 etal is just the profinite completion of the topological pi 1. These are not the same thing, but they're closely related. And this uh, homomorphism is canonical, sort of up to conjugation and also up to choosing. And conjugation is sort of implied in a choice of uh, embedding of k bar into c. All right. So what we get. Now, it's important to note that GK almost never will actually act on this discrete group. If X is a finite type variety, this is going to be some sort of finitely generated group. And your Galois group will not act on that. It will only act on the profinite completion. Um, and we understand a lot of things about this action, but it's still fairly mysterious. Um, so. The idea here is that if you have this pi 1 etal, then somehow, this, because this gk, uh, which I'm not going to explain, because this Galois action, let's say that k is our, now let's say k is a number field. So idea, k, implies, uh, k over q finite and pi 1 etal of x over k bar sufficiently rich implies pi 1 etal of x over k determines x. So there's a sense in which this is a very much an extension of, of this of this I mean of this Torelli of this Torelli process um, in the sense that I have a uh, I have some geometric object uh, and I have some this is a discrete geometric object this is going to be invariant under continuous deformation of x and families over k bar and then I have this other guy which gives me um, which is just a very rich structure, and it gives me um, it gives me things which I can sort of I can use to mimic these more traditional Hodge structures, these continuous invariants. Um, and so, because of this, uh, 
we have this we have this philosophy. The question is um, one of the main questions which people have been dealing with in the past 30, 30 I guess it's no, it's almost thirty years since Groth and Deke, uh, uh sort of proposed this. Is what does it mean to be sufficiently rich? Is X a curve here? X. Uh, no, this is this is a very general statement. This is a very general statement. Um, and then one of the theorems is that if x is a hyperbolic curve, then this is sufficiently rich. For higher dimensional varieties, um, it becomes a bit more complicated. Uh, I don't know of theorems of this sort uh, for higher dimensional varieties, except in the birational case, in which case we have uh, the really spectacular solution. And for curves, by the way, this is a, a very, this goes back to Tamagawa, uh, Nakamura, and Mochizuki in the uh, compact case, which is uh, a really neat piece of mathematics uh, that I, I have no idea about. Um, <laughs> yes? No, it's not true for elliptic curves. And in fact, I can give you a counterexample to this being true for elliptic curves right now. So take your favorite imaginary quadratic number field with class number two. <laughs> or greater than, greater than one. Uh, that's the only thing that matters. Um, then what you know um, by the classical theory of complex multiplication is that, so because pi one et al of the elliptic curve over k bar um, over q bar, uh, that is going to be isomorphic to z2 hat. So it's going to be a product of zps. Um, and what you get is exactly the, the tensoring by a, a class, the, the Serre tensor construction. It gives you that the two, uh, that the two pi 1 etals as Galois representations are isomorphic, but the curves are merely isogenous. Faulting's theorem in general tells you that for elliptic, for abelian varieties, um, this, is, this statement is true up to isogeny. And that's one of the reasons why Groth and Deke had proposed that maybe if I stick some um, non-abelian uh, non -abelian phenomena, that maybe this will rigidify the situation enough where you'll get rid of this isogeny problem. You get the whole... You get the whole trace of Frobenius, right? Because these, these two things are going to be, yeah. OK. Um, yeah, so this doesn't quite work. And you know, one would actually be tempted to say that this works for P1, because there's only one P1, uh, at least over, 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 over Q. Um, no, no, I'm, I lied. There's not only one P1 over Q. <laughs> I take that back. That's the whole point. There's only one P1 over Q bar, but there are lots of, but uh, P1 has a rich automorphism group. And this won't capture that. Um, so one somehow, what one would hope for is, is not just that this determines X, but actually there's um, an equivalence of categories between certain fun etal fundamental groups, uh, perhaps with extra structure, and the varieties from which they come. OK. Now, in, in the early 1990s, uh, Bokomolov noticed something very interesting, which was that maybe, so, so like I said, I, I, the way I want to view this is that the etal fundamental group of, a, of something over a number field, over a finitely generated field, sort of has this mixture of the discrete and continuous invariance, which allows us to, um, which allows us to, to sort of solve these Anabelian or, or, Schottky pro, or Torelli problems. Um, but in the early 1990s, Bogomolov noticed uh, something very interesting, which was that maybe you can do away with the, continuous, uh, with the continuous aspects entirely if you're willing to go to a large enough discrete setting. Uh, so what do I mean by that? What he did was he had this idea
So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let now x be a surf be a variety of dimension greater than two, greater than, or equal to two over q bar. Okay, uh, and. This over q bar, by the way, in, in everything I'm going to say, it's technically crucial. Uh, I don't want to say why at the moment. It has something to do with field theory. Uh, but I also don't think that it's crucial in the long run. I think we'll be able to get over this eventually. Uh, because the geometric methods that I'm about, that I'll show you a little bit later, do not require uh, rationality at all. Um, they don't require that you can define things over q bar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now define a group. Okay. Uh, the divisors on x uh, form a, uh, so not, I don't quite want the divisors. I want the uh, one dimensional reduced uh, co-dimension one reduced uh, sub-varieties. So the idea is that these are just going to be sums of prime divisors where all the coefficients are either 1 or 0. Okay. Uh, on x, form a uh, a directed system. So that, in fact, the spaces x less the divisors form an inverse system. Okay. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to define So this is going to be, so the requirement that I'm going to have, uh, since I'm over q bar, is that each of these d's is going to be a divisor over q bar. And this pi 1 is going to be the topological pi 1 of the corresponding analytic space. So I can base change to c. And then I'll need to make a bunch of choices. Uh, but I can do that. Do you have a baseline problem here? Do you want the base point that misses all the divisors? Well, you can do like a tangential base point type trick where you pick some contractible neighborhood which gets smaller and then you keep, need to keep making choices as you go up the ladder. So, but in the end, everything's going to be conjugate no matter what base point you choose. So you do sort of have a base point problem, but it's not so difficult. By now we know how to get around it. <laughs> I think this would have been much more a problem 50 years ago. Um, at any rate, uh, so I have this group. And the reason I'm calling this g q bar of x top is because it's profinite completion. Do you have a question? OK. Because it's profinite completion is actually the absolute Galois group of the q bar function field of this variety. Okay. And what, what Bogomolov discovered, uh, sort of in a overfinite uh, over fields, um, and it was Pope who actually ended up proving the theorem as I'm going to state it, um, is that I can write down, if I give you an element of here, I can tell you if it's a meridian of some divisor that I've taken out. So what do I mean by this? Uh, if I give you an element sigma in there exists a group theoretic, a purely group theoretic criterion in terms of this group. Um, and in fact, it's going to be in terms of its profinite completion. Uh, but I won't, I won't talk about that quite yet. Um, then I know whether it is the meridian of some prime divisor. I want to say, uh, 
a meridian of some prime divisor. So what do I mean by this? What I mean is that in every quotient, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick, so my x I'm going to represent by the you know, emptiness of space. And then, uh, so sort of things that exist are now black, and things that are not there anymore will be white. So now I have my divisor, which is going to look like this. You know, I don't care. Um, and what I'm going to do is a meridian, so I'll choose my base point, which of course is arbitrary and might move. And what I do is I draw some path from this base point, and then I get it really close to this divisor. I go around, and then I go back. And that's going to be a meridian. This is unique up to conjugacy in each of this as I go up the tower. Um, and the point is that I can detect these groups. Um, I can detect the z's that come out of this. And it has a generator. Each of these has you know, two generators that I can pick. Um, so I have that choice. But other than that, there's, there's not much. Oh, sorry, when you say you detect them, do you mean group theoretically? You detect them? Yes, there's a group theoretical recipe uh, by which I can just get the set of all of these. Um, and in fact, I can do something a little bit more. Uh, I can get somehow a higher co-dimension meridian out of this game. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, in this picture, uh, so I'm now going to use this chalk, this purple chalk, for something that is. Uh, and so what is going to be here now is some curve. As I go up the tower, I'm going to keep puncturing this curve, and that's fine, but there will always be this curve minus finitely many, or sorry, not curve, divisor. Here I'm talking about divisor. There will be this divisor minus finitely many divisors. Uh, and what I can do is I can, in fact, detect the meridians which lie on this divisor. Um, which is a bit more intricate than finding the meridians which lie there. Because, for instance, if this divisor winds around this point a few times, and this meridian is going to be, uh, then this meridian is going to look, it's going to look twisty if something is taken out. This is a little bit confusing. But, uh, I'll talk about this in a little while. Uh, the fact that I can distinguish between things that come on this divisor is exactly what's going to allow me to do intersection theory. So given, so, so given the sigma, I have this recipe. Um, and there's something else that I know. Uh, when you say group theoretically, once you prescribe that divisor, are you saying you like, you know, uh, you, you give yourself a subgroup along with it? Uh, yes, this is a general thing, that any time I give, I give you that divisor, there always exists a subgroup in each, each one of these. And then when I say group theoretically, what I mean is that I don't need to, all I need to know is that this group is of this form, is of this form, but I don't need to know what this q bar of x is. I don't need to know what this x is. I have some I, I'm just asking, in terms of this, uh, this more defined construction, what additional data on top of that g top q bar of x did you give yourself? Nothing. Well, I mean, then how do you know it's... Uh, it doesn't know which divisor it is. Oh, it, it, it lives on some divisor. It, that's the point, yes. I, I know that they live on some divisor, and the other thing that I know is that I can tell the different divisors, one from another, because any two divisors will have, any two different divisors will lie in different conjugacy classes in this whole group. These, these will always separate in the limit. But that's somehow the heart of the problem. This is what, um, in some sense, the whole point of the rest of this talk is going to answer the question, which divisor? Um, well, why should they uh, not be conjugate? I mean, suppose there's a group action on the variety itself. Oh, it's, I mean, one easy way to see this is that what I can do is if I take out a bunch of divisors, I can always express this. I can always take out more divisors to get a vibration of, uh, a vibration, a successive vibration of curves. And since, uh, and you can just check that in that, 
uh, when you get that, that the, each of the divisors that I've taken out is going to be non-conjugate. This also follows from field theory. This is something about separation of valuations. Um, and in fact, I'm completely obscuring the field theory which is used to prove this. Uh, in fact, this is not a geometric theorem in some sense. This is a field theoretic theorem. Um, and what people did not do um, before my thesis is actually try to ascribe a geometry to it. We're trying to use this for geometry. But that's what we're going to do now. Um, the other input that we need is one needs to know, so it turns out that uh, if I'm dimension greater than or equal to 2 over q bar, I not only know what uh, these divisors are and these higher co-dimension um, and these higher co-dimension meridians. But what I, what I also know is, um, I also know what the co-dimension one theories of actual varieties are. So what do I mean by that? So the, let's do it here, chop. So uh, definition, let x be, uh, let x prime be birational x, okay? Then this is canonically isomorphic uh, up to conjugation. To this guy. And so in both of these, I can pick out the, all the meridians of the divisors that lie on x prime and the ones that lie on x. And I'm going to call that subset, uh, that set of meridians, I'm going to call that a geometric um, set. So the uh, denoted S of X prime. And uh, a theorem of Pope uh, from not so long ago is that, or actually maybe this, this might even be 14 years old and it, it's just now written up pretty recently, uh, is that inside of this I can actually detect the geometric sets. So what does that mean? If I give you a set of these meridians, I give you a set of these conjugacy classes of, of groups of meridians, then I have a way of determining whether or not there exists some variety by rational to the x that I started with, on which that is exactly the meridian for all the prime divisors that occur on x prime. So an example of, uh, yes. That's what I want. You don't ask this variety x to have any good properties at all. It, it can. I'm, that's exactly the point. Is that it, it's? I'm asking for all possible sets of such things. There just has to exist a variety, and that's that's the point. Is that all I know is if I give you a set, I can tell you whether or not there exists a variety, but I don't know anything about that variety. Um, I can always assume that it's. Uh, I can always assume that it's non-singular, but it might not be proper. Or I can assume that it's normal and proper. Why can't you, sorry, why can't you just close it up to make it proper? I mean, if you're removing all the values, then it seems like other dimension one is going to take care of everything for you. Uh, what do you mean by can't that? Can't you pick like a non-singular closure or something and work with that? Ah, but see, if I if I choose a non-singular, so 
in the end, yes, you will want to use resolution of singularities and asserting that there always exists that. But for instance, it's entirely possible that you, there does not exist, but when you resolve singularities, you add new divisors. But finite domain, you're right. I mean, exactly. But I, I need to be able, in this reconstruction, I actually want to be able to distinguish between two different geometric sets and to say that they're different. But it doesn't just mean they have different, finitely many different numbers of these varieties. They do, but for instance, here's, here's a question. If I give you a geometric set, and this is a question that I'm able to answer, um, at least in dimension two. Um, if I give you a geometric set, does there exist a smooth proper model with that, ex with that geometric set? Oh, so you can tell also if you take properties of the variety. Exactly, if there's a smooth proper model. So this is going to actually be the goal. So in the end, what I'm going to do is in dimension two, and I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll generalize this to higher dimensions. The, Somehow the, the ground is set. I'm just not doing it quite yet. Um, what I'm going to be able to do is I'm going to be able to take this in dimension two. I'm able to take this geometric set and I'm actually able to write down a scheme <laughs> from the group theory such that um, this fundamental group, this limit of fundamental, such that every all of the valuations that are induced, all of the meridians sit where they need to sit. What is your definition of a meridian? I oh, I'm sorry. So what that, it's right here. Uh, so what I do is a meridian around a divisor is, um, is something which is conjugate to uh, a small loop around the divisor. It can be localized around. Yes, but the loop is defined over what field? This is something over C. And if you, in here, in this definition, we're looking at the inverse limit of topological fundamental groups. So we're already taking the analytic spaces. It's just a regular loop, yeah. It's all algebraic geometry. I mean, this is all somehow differential geometry. OK. Uh, so there's a recipe for this. And now what I do is I say that, in fact, if I give you one of these geometric sets, I'm now going to work in, in, dimension, uh, in dimension just two. Uh, though, as I said, um, there, I think I know how to generalize this, but I haven't written it up yet. Um, so in dimension two, what I can do, so something that's easy to see. So in dimension two, we're, we're very nice because our, our birational theory is, is somehow, is somehow good uh, in the sense that if I give you a geometric set, if I give you the set of prime divisors on one of these varieties, then there exists a unique maximal smooth variety with that co-dimension one theory, but not necessarily proper. Okay, um, so this is almost a lemma. This is just the fact that every point looks like every other point. And you can't really glue in two points in different, there are no flips in. Uh, <laughs> when you say variety, you mean separated? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and in fact, the way that I'm going to use variety is actually, the way that I technically sort of need to deal with varieties is as valuations on a field. So I'm going to be using, I mean, everything that I'm doing somehow uh, it can be done in the language of foundations. <laughs> And that's even somehow the most natural place to do it, uh, just in the sense that I'm, in the end, I'm really dealing with valuations on a field. That's what I'm secretly doing here. And I don't really want to talk about that right now because I'm trying to talk about geometry. But there's this whole algebraic side which is veish <laughs> somehow. Um, and somehow that's, that's what God gives you. That's what you see in these fundamental groups. You see valuations. And then everything else has to come out of that. Um, so the theorem is given a geometric set S, there exists a unique maximal smooth model of uh, S. Okay, and we're going to call that And again, secretly what I'm doing is I'm fixing the field of meromorphic functions, the field of Q-bar functions on this. Um, and the way that you can see that uh, 
fixation is that I'm fixing sort of which divisors go to which, which meridians go to which in this topological fundamental group. So this is now dimension equals 2. This is a lie if dimension is not equal to 2. Um, so for instance, it, yeah, so I, I don't want to talk about that anymore. Uh, now, the way the singularity theory comes in is as follows. And this theorem is going to be more of a picture than a theorem. Uh, the way that singularity theorem com theory comes in is I need to be able, I'm going to describe to you in a moment how to reconstruct um, a variety if I know its divisors and I know sufficiently enough about the way that they intersect, um, at least a surface. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that, uh, so, so here's, here's what I want to say. There's a thread of algebraic geometry which goes back to Zariski um, from the late 20s, which deals with plane curve complements and the fundamental groups of plane curve complements. And one of the ideas uh, that's implicit in, in this is that the fundamental group of a complement, if the complement is complicated enough, somehow should reveal most of the algebraic geometry of the things that you're complementing inside of the space that you're complementing them from. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that you can detect in this, if you're careful, is the intersection number between, um, is a local, or local intersection numbers. So what I'd said earlier is that I have this recipe for if I give you a curve like this, then I have this recipe for the meridian which sits on this curve. And let's say that this, uh, yeah. And I also have the recipe, if I give you a separate curve, which is going to be the thing that I complement out, um, and I'm sorry I don't have more dimensions to draw in, but really this is a co-dimension two picture. And it's really the co-dimension that counts here. Um, and if I have a separate curve and I, um, if I have this curve and I take its complement, then what I'm going to get is that the intersection number, and so now let's make this, let's make this big, let's make this big assumption. And making this assumption work actually, showing that you can always force this assumption to hold in a productive manner where uh, all of these formulas don't get confused sort of by global considerations, is actually going to be a result of the hodge lefschetz one one theorem in the end. Um, because the hodge lefschetz one one theorem tells you that any time I have an intersection between uh, two cycles, which may or may not be algebraic, uh, two divisors, which may or may not be algebraic, uh, or one divisor which is algebraic and another cycle which is not algebraic, then the intersection form has to factor through algebraic cycles. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do here is uh, I will say if I take out this curve and I look at a meridian around this curve and now I'm going to stop looking in the fundamental group and I'm going to look in homology. I need the fundamental group in order to detect these meridians. But now everything I'm going to do is in homology. So I can move this meridian down onto this curve at the point of intersection. And what I'm going to get is that the index of, um, it should be obvious. Uh, so I have two curves. Uh, I have curve C1 and curve C2. So I have a meridian around C1, which is a loop in the normal bundle, and I'm going to move it down to C2, and I'm going to move it down so that it lies on C2. Well, if they intersect. I, I still not think like, you know, what if they're both singular at the intersection? So if they're both singular at the intersection, you can resolve and take out all of the singular curves. And actually the theorem that goes, so there's a theorem which says that you can do this. So, so let me tell you what the theorem says. It says that the index uh, of this, the index of this, uh, of the uh, group generated by the curve around, uh, uh, the curve around this point sitting on C2 
inside of the group generated by the curve around C1 is equal to the algebraic intersection number of these two curves. If you want to write in symbols... Uh, Great idea. So let's call this meridian... Uh, I'll call this meridian... Suppose C2 has locally two components of the intersection. Okay. No. That's what I do not want to do. I'm, look, I'm going to be able, since I can pick out the prime, to, since I can pick out these meridians. Okay, when you do intersection theory. Analytically, locally, has two components, but globally, it doesn't. Take C2 to be something like a nodal qubit. Take C1 to oh, be sure. passing through the node. Sure. Okay, take the meridian around C1. Which branch of C2 does it go on? Ah, it's going to be a sum of the two branches. So it can't. I mean, so what's the actual statement, but where you put that, put that loop? I'll, I'll do that right now. So the actual statement is more complicated. Well, yeah, what I need is I need, I do this separately for each branch. I do this separately for each branch. Um, and so let's assume that C2 is locally unibranch. Um, and then what I'm going to get is that the, the index of the group generated by this is going to be uh, just the sum of the, it's going to be generated, it's going to have to be the sum of each of the, each of the loops around each of the branch points in homology, okay? So let's assume that this is unibranch now. Um, and what I get is that the group generated, uh, so I'll call this loop now uh, MC1, and I will call this loop now MC2P. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, so I can just assume this is a local picture, and this is unit branch, and this is whatever. Um, and now what I'll get is that uh, MC2P is going to be equal to uh, the intersection in homology in a neighborhood in homology in a neighborhood of this intersection. I'm going to get that MC2P uh, is going to be equal to the local intersection number of C1 with C2 at P times MC1. I think that's the right direction. It's, yeah. Uh, okay, and so that's a theorem. If you want to find this in the literature, apparently Reeve wrote a paper uh, in 54 which has this. And I'd ask Kronheimer for a reference at some point. And, and yeah, but if you want to, I mean, it's obvious enough when you've been dealing with this enough. It's not completely obvious, I don't think. You can do this by, you can actually prove this by induction by resolving the singularity and then doing an induction on the blow-up tree. I know you can do it. I haven't done it. Uh, in fact, I waited for the not theorist to tell me that it was obvious, and then I took it as such. <laughs> but I, I didn't actually find it. I mean, I found it intuitive, but when I was trying to write a proof of it, uh, whether it's obvious or not is a, is, a, is a slightly touchy question. But it's true, and that's the important thing. Um, uh, yeah, because that induction proof really promised to be painful. So what one can do, so you write down this, you write down this, 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 uh, you can write down this formula, and so then what that allows you to do is that allows you to get this intersection number as long as I can, as, as long as I'm in a situation where I can assume that this group is maximal. So there's no global effect which kills this, which makes this torsion. Um, and so what you do in order to make a global intersection number is you carefully, since I have the set of all divisors, I carefully take out divisors which do not intersect at this point to the point where locally the theory is as nice as it gets. And once I have that this is a Z, everything is fine as long as I'm not, uh, as long as I'm not there. And now I have this group theoretic recipe for intersection. So from that, uh, what one can do um, and this is another thing which is not, this, is a, this part is actually somehow very much not, not trivial, but um, you have this problem where you get that your intersection works at almost every point. In, you can define points now as being equivalence classes of these loops around points 
on these curves, and you identify two of them if they go around the same point in this given variety. Um, but the problem is that it's, it's very difficult to figure out whether, uh, whether this point, uh, you can define points this way, but these loops will be defined even if, you, even if somehow this is not a point on the curve. So you'll have some boundary loops. And you need to figure out a way to get rid of that. Um, and so the way that you do this is you use this local intersection number to find a criterion for making art in good neighborhoods. So these neighborhoods which are vibrations, topologically vibrations of, of hyperbolic curves over hyperbolic curves. And I need them to be hyperbolic. Because once you have that they're hyperbolic, you have a test. Uh, by the fiber sequence for hyperbolic curves, you have a test for whether a point lies on the boundary or not, which is whether its inertia group is non-trivial, whether the meridian actually shows up in the fundamental group when I don't take out any divisors. Um, but then, even once I have this, I need some criterion of showing that actually these, these curves, I can get the code, I need to figure out how I get the co-dimension one theory of one of these. And the way that you do it is you use this intersection theory sort of almost everywhere. You get, an inter, you get an intersection number which holds at almost every fiber that you think it should hold at. Um, and then you pick an arbitrary compactification. You prove that these form an algebraic family in that arbitrary compactification. And then you have a monodromy condition which ensures that you can actually go back to the original setting that you found and that you have what you think you had in the beginning. So the way that you get these, so the way that you actually detect points is this way. But the beautiful thing is once you can detect points in this way, you can also detect the rational functions, which means that you can start actually writing down explicitly from the group theory the linear systems of divisors. Um, and then use the fundamental theorem of projective geometry um, as written in, and for a reference of this, I give you Artin's Geometric Algebra, a beautiful book. And uh, what that allows you to do is that allows you to write down all of the L of NDs, and essentially each of these families forms a collineation, which means that I can now pick out the original vector spaces and I can write down the, if I'm given a geometric set which actually is projective, I can write down proj of that directly from this picture and from using the fundamental theorem of geometric algebra. There's a way in which all of this somehow feels like, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, half of this comes from like the 1970s and half of this comes from 1900. Uh, <laughs> so that's how you do it. And so now I want to, I can quickly tell you how it is that one gets anything about Galois groups um, out of this. So one corollary of this procedure is that if I look at that GQ, if I look at this guy top, what I really get is that this is isomorphic to G. Uh, this profinitely completed is now isomorphic to the absolute Galois group of this function field. And what I've proven, because I can do all of this reconstruction, because I see all of the geometric structure of this function field, because I can write down this stupid thing now, given this group, what I get is that the outer automorphisms of this, so what I see is theorem. Okay, uh, so the outer automorphisms of this guy, just as a group, are the same as the automorphisms of this as a field. It's easy to construct um, a field whose automorphisms are exactly Galois of Q bar over Q, or exactly Galois of K bar over K for any number field. It's a, easy to construct the function field of a surface which has that property. For instance, I can take two hyperbolic curves with no geometric automorphisms whose minimal um, field of definition is the, is the number field that I care about. Um, and then what that allows me to get is that gives me now a group, just a group, whose outer automorphisms is the absolute Galois group of my favorite number field. Uh, great. So I think I'll stop there. Are there, I know there were lots of questions already. Are there questions? So what does this have to do with the mean of vibration? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I don't know yet.
in the singularities here we are telling it that you see something about that. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I do, but I, I haven't been able to think about it. <laughs> I haven't been able to think about it lately. Um, this is sort of, I mean, so because you see these, see I've used this really crude property of singularities. Um, and I am chomping at the bit to figure out how to sort of incorporate the rest of the topological the theory of curve singularities into this picture, if there's some more information that I can glean from this. Um, because really, this gives, this gives you from the topological, from, this, from just this group, it gives you somehow everything you would want to know about the local structure. And then you know, turning this into an effective algorithm for something is something I would like to do. But I'm not, I mean, I have certain things that I think I can get effective algorithms for. In singularity theory, I don't know yet, but that's because I'm not a singular. <laughs> I don't know enough about these things. Um, but we can talk about that. I'd love to know. <laughs> Are there other questions, comments, more comments? I was just wondering, so once you have that theorem there, right, how do you detect this from the group theory? Because you're saying it's true in the homology of a neighborhood of intersection, right? Yeah. How do you detect that neighborhood using your picture? Mm. Uh, what you need to do is you take out a complement of, you take out more divisors to ensure that uh, somehow, so, th so, so locally this is what happens. If this is unibranch, there's nothing more that happens globally. If this is multibranch, then you're going to get that summing. Well, say it's unibranch, I mean, just we have the meridians, right? How do you take the intersection number? It's just, a, it's just going to be a group theoretic index of one of, of the group generated by one meridian with the group generated by the other the meridian. Of the in the abelianization of the total group. Exactly. And I know all these fundamental groups because the fundamental group of a model is going to be, the fundamental group of a variety, if it's smooth, is going to be the quotient of the, this big G top by all of the meridians supported on it. And this in algebra, I guess, is Nagata's risky purity theorem. Any other questions, comments, complaints? No? All right, well, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>